Quarterly Journal of Speech 81, 1995, 291 to 309. Whiteness, a strategic rhetoric. Thomas K. Nakayama and Robert L. Krizek consider, for example, how age, gender, being an outsider, and association with a neo-colonial regime influence what the ethnographer learns. The notion of position refers to how life experiences both enable and inhibit particular kinds of insight. Rizaldo 19. Although all people exist within what we might call the strata of subjectivity, they are also located at particular positions within the strata, each of which enables and constrains the possibilities of experience but even more, of representing and legitimating those representations. Grossberg 13. W.E. Open with discourses grounded in two diverse, yet related universes, ethnography and cultural studies. Each addresses the possibilities of human experience as both barriers and bridges that influence knowledge in its expression. In addition, each invokes the metaphor of space by naming those possibilities as positions. The emergence of the spatial metaphor in academic work has encouraged scholars in cultural studies and ethnography alike to rethink the ways in which individuals and groups construct identity, administer power, and make sense of their everyday lives. Our dialogues are now replete with spatial tropes of boundaries, centers, margins, and borderlands. More recently, in addition to the uncomplicated binary reality of centers and margins, we find an expanding discussion of discursive spaces, fields of interaction, trajectories, and territories, each contributing a somewhat distinct and theoretically challenging lens. These new metaphors invite the disarrangement of modern thought by promoting a complex spatial view of postmodern life which honors the legitimacy of multiple realities. At the same time, these spatial metaphors consider the milieu present at the intersection of differing realities while recognizing the variance within each of the realities. In this essay we are interested in a specific position. The discursive space of white. White is a relatively uncharted territory that has remained invisible as it continues to influence the identity of those both within and without its domain. It affects the everyday fabric of our lives but resists, sometimes violently, any extensive characterization that would allow for the mapping of its contours. It wields power yet endures as a largely unarticulated position. One the place from which power is exercised is often a hidden place. When we try to pin it down, the center always seems to be somewhere else. Yet we know that this phantom center, elusive as it is, exerts a real, undeniable power over the entire framework of our culture, and over the ways we thinking about it. Ferguson 19. We come to this project with highly personal, yet similar expectations. For reasons rooted in accidents of our remote biographies, we both seek to expose the meanings of white. One of us knows what it is to be a Japanese-American from the South a position often diminished by the two primary racial realities white and black. I've always been aware of terms or words others use and that I used to describe myself. For a long time I was very sensitive. I wanted people to call me a Japanese-American, downloaded by New York University, at 2347 the 18th of October 20. 292 Quarterly Journal of Speech August 1995 Not a Japanese but my position as an American was not the defining position. White was. The other of us grew up in a well-positioned suburb of Chicago, a suburb with a single racial reality. It was the opposite for me. I've gone through life never consciously thinking about labels. I suppose we defined ourselves as one of those people we didn't label, although nobody ever said that. We were just white, not black or brown, and I don't really know what that means. No one ever questioned it. Although we have experienced the influence of white from different positions, one inside the territory of white and one outside, or at least not on the inside, we both come to this project in search of the hidden place. One of us pursues rhetorical urges, the other ethnographic, both critical. And though we both read texts for the purpose of rendering an informed interpretation, our motivations for reading the text of white differ. For me it's clarifying some of the ways that white has exerted its force on everybody else, on me. The ways that they have been able to maintain that position through invisibility, that everything nests that normalizing potential or whatever you want to call it. 
I want to disrupt the power that resides in White's discursive space. There is another side to being culturally invisible. When I started realizing that other people were able to articulate and appreciate aspects of their cultural heritage, I began to feel uncomfortable about being transparent. Although I understand that mapping the territory of white will be disruptive, I encourage the disruption. I don't believe that my identity is continuous with white's invisible power, and I'm searching for those discontinuities as meaningful cultural experiences. Despite our different motives, biographical details, and research agendas, we both recognized our own experiences in Ferguson's words presented above. We both caught a glimpse of our own reflections. As such, we believe that the time has come to deterritorialize the territory of white to expose, examine, and disrupt. In this essay we begin that process by surveying, exposing and examining the territory of white so that it like other positions may be placed under critical analysis. In order to accomplish this end, we investigate the strategies that mark the space of whiteness. Our critical move is attained through a nominalist rhetoric, that is, by naming whiteness, we displace its centrality and reveal its invisible position. We undertake this examination of whiteness through a mixture of textual data revealed in popular discourse, open-ended surveys, to and interviews. 3. Our goal is to develop some initial insights into how whites have constructed their own social locations of whiteness. In this essay, then, we examine whiteness as a rhetorical construction and discuss some of the ways it resecures its central position. Ultimately, the goal of this project is to extend our understanding of positionality and its relation to research through this exploration of whiteness, making THECENTER invisible historically. The development of the study of communication has followed a focus on the center. Plato and Aristotle, from a privileged class, were not interested in theorizing or empowering ways that women, slaves, or other culturally marginalized people might speak. The reader was always already assumed to be a member of the downloaded by 293 Quarterly Journal of Speech Nakayama and Krizek Center. Spellman argues that both Plato and Aristotle have a normative notion of humanness that is inseparable from a notion of masculinity, which is of course normative 54. Spellman's analyses demonstrates the ways that race and gender get conflated in order to center male citizens. While the configuration of the racial, ethnic territory has shifted from the place of ancient Greece to contemporary North America, the assumption of centeredness has remained intact and unquestioned. As a consequence of this historical framework, in U.S. culture, whiteness has assumed the position of an uninterrogated space. In sum, we do not know what whiteness means. An earlier attempt to get at this problem, by a citizen of the center, underscores an important paradox and risk. When we examine ourselves as whites and all that we stand for in the world today, we find a paradox. We are not what we suppose ourselves to be. We have fancied ourselves the good guys who make a few mistakes. But that is not what we find. Dutcher 97. The risk for critical researchers who choose to interrogate whiteness, including those in ethnography and cultural studies, is the risk of essentialism. Whatever whiteness really means is constituted only through the rhetoric of whiteness. There is no true essence to whiteness, there are only historically contingent constructions of that social location. Foucault's principle of exteriority explains the rhetorical sensibility, rather than essential nature, of discursive events. W. E. are not to burrow into the hidden core of discourse, to the heart of thought or meaning, manifested in it, instead, taking the discourse itself, its appearance and its regularity. That we should look for its external conditions of existence for that which gives rise to the chance series of these events and fixes its limits. Discourse on Language 229. Yet the social location of whiteness, is perceived as if it had a normative essence. It is important that we acknowledge that the radicality or conservatism of essentialism depends to a significant degree, on who is utilizing it, how it is deployed, and where its effects are concentrated. Bus 20. By viewing whiteness as a rhetorical construction, we avoid searching for any essential nature to whiteness. 
Instead, we seek an understanding of the ways that this rhetorical construction makes itself visible and invisible, eluding analysis yet exerting influence over everyday life. The invisibility of whiteness has been manifested through its universality. The universality of whiteness resides in its already defined position as everything. Richard Dyer makes an important point. In the realm of categories, black is always marked as a color, as the term, colored, egregiously acknowledges, and is always particularizing, whereas white is not anything really, not an identity, not a particularizing quality, because it is everything, white is no color because it is all colors. 45. Thus, the experiences and communication patterns of whites are taken as the norm from which others are marked. If we take a critical perspective to whiteness, however, we can begin the process of particularizing white experience. This move displaces whites from a universal stance which has tended to normalize and to download it by 294 Quarterly Journal of Speech August 1995 naturalize their positionality to a more specific social location in which they confront the kinds of questions and challenges facing any particular social location. As Fry underscores, what this can mean to white people is that we are not white by nature but by political classification, 118. In light of the influential political position of whiteness, it is surprising that critical scholars have not yet scrutinized the center in the ways that they have been probing the margins. Despite the historical domination of the center and the myriad of ways it exerts its influence on the margins, our discipline has not been critical of this dominance over communication studies. In this paper we push the territory of the center in new directions, much as critical scholars have pushed the margins. By critically examining this space, it gains particularity, while losing universality. We see this conceptual move as one that is counter-hegemonic, as it challenges the normalizing position of the center, whiteness, making THE center visible in Marxism and the philosophy of language. Velosinov comments on the multi-accentuality of the ideological sign, various different classes will use one and the same language. As a result, differently oriented accents intersect in every ideological sign. Sign becomes an arena of the class struggle, 23. His emphasis on the sign as a site of class struggle opens up the sign, white to a range of interpretations, contradictions, and meanings as it unfolds within existing social relations, but not necessarily limited to class. In order to expose the complex, and often contradictory, functionings of white, we explore what Deserto might identify as a strategic rhetoric by combining Foucault's concepts of discursive formations in power with Deleuze and Guattari's notion of assemblage to uncover the ways in which whiteness exerts its influence throughout the social fabric. Although the writings of Deleuze and Guattari have been given little attention in the field of critical communication studies, Chan 44, we believe that the importance of their work is easily recognized in its compatibility with contemporary critical work, as well as its offering of a new approach to view and critique. First, like critical rhetoric, Makuro theory and praxis, Deleuze and Guattari do not prescribe methodology. Instead, they offer the concept of the nomadic scholar who is not constrained by methodology, but by perspective. Second, they offer a spatial view of power relations that upends traditional, linear histories. Thus, it is important that we understand the assemblages that produce and reproduce power relations in particular ways. This is compatible with a Grossberg's call that cultural studies explore the concrete ways in which different machines, or, in Foucault's terms, apparatuses produce the specific spaces, configurations, and circulations of power. Eight. Finally, Deleuze and Guattari offer a new way of critique, i.e., the territorialization. Once we view power spatially, a re-articulation of the space of the assemblage is a counter-hegemonic move. Prior to rewriting this space, however, we must first identify the assemblage and see how it functions mechanically. We believe that some of the importance of Deleuze and Guattari can be seen in how this spatial politics can function as critique, rather than theory. Hence, we identify and critique the assemblage of whiteness. Da 295 Quarterly Journal of Speech Nakayama and Krizak Tactical Rhetorics in the Practice of Everyday Life Michel de Certeau makes an interesting distinction between strategies and tactics. 
We find this frame useful for exploring the larger discursive framework that guides white identity. A distinction between strategies and tactics appears to provide a more adequate initial schema. I call a strategy the calculation or manipulation of power relationships that becomes possible as soon as a subject with will and power, a business, an army, a city, a scientific institution, can be isolated. It postulates a place that can be delimited as its own and serve as the base from which relations with an exteriority composed of targets, threats, customers or competitors, enemies, the country surrounding the city, objectives and objects of research, etc. can be managed. By contrast with a strategy, a tactic is a calculated action determined by the absence of a proper locus. No delimitation of an exteriority, then, provides it with a condition necessary for autonomy. The space of a tactic is the space of the other. Thus it must play on and with a terrain imposed on it and organized by the law of a foreign power. It does not have the means to keep to itself, at a distance, in a position of withdrawal, foresight, and self-collection. 35-37 we conclude from this that the discursive frame that negotiates and reinforces white dominance in U.S. society operates strategically. It is this strategic rhetoric that we wish to explore. This strategic rhetoric is not itself a place but it functions to re-secure the center, the place, for whites. Before we examine this strategic rhetoric, we turn to a discussion of the tactical rhetorics that have emerged in response to this center. Racial and ethnic identity is certainly not a new topic of discussion, particularly by those in the margins. In the face of social, economic and political changes, these discourses have shifted over time. While these places are now marked as marginalized, others have long been reflexive on their positionalities vis-a-vis -vis the center. African Americans, Asante, Bobo, Bogle, Christian, Collins, Combahee River Collective, Henry Louis Gates Jr., Gray, Hooks, Houston Stanback, Lord, Nesta B., Smythe, Cornell West, Arab Americans, said, Sheehan, Asian Americans, Asian Women United of California, Leong, Nakagawa, Nakayama, OMI, San Juan, Tachiki et al., Takaki, Trint, Latino, as Anz Aldua, Fragoso and Chabram, Moraga, Noriega, Tano, and Native Americans. Friar and Friar, Alaskakis, have all interrogated the complex relations, social, historical, cultural, political, economic various groups have to the center. Those who are not a part of the domestic U.S. social sphere have also interrogated their relationships to whiteness from a variety of perspectives as well. Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies, Fannin, Gilroy, Hall, Mema, Spivak, Uchida, our intent is not to diminish the importance of these researchers attempting to inscribe their social locations, gender and sexual orientation as well as racial, ethnic positions for into their work, nor is it our intent to discourage ongoing to discussions about whiteness by writers of color. These studies have made significant contributions toward understanding the ways that people of color have interrogated and examined their complex relationships with whiteness. They have also opened up the territory of whiteness to critique. The interests of these writers, however, are geared toward exposing and questioning the spaces that exist between various groups and whiteness. For example, in Black Looks, Bell Hooks observes that the oppositional black culture that emerged in the context of apartheid and segregation has been one of the few locations that has provided a space for the kind of decolonization that downloaded by 296 Quarterly Journal of Speech August 1995 makes loving blackness possible 10. She warns correctly we believe that attempts to treat whiteness as victimizing to whites as well, in the hopes that this will act as an intervention is a misguided strategy 13. In contrast, our concerns are focused on the ways that the territory of whiteness is able to mask and resecure its space through a movement between universality and invisibility. To treat whiteness as marginalized, or marginalizing, seems wrong-headed as it levels the power differentials between that which is strategic and that which is tactical. An asterisk strategic rhetoric Foucault, like Deleuze and Guattari, is particularly useful in analyzing the strategic rhetoric of whiteness because he does not see power as exercised in a naked manner. For him, power operates in much more complex, relationally situated ways.
In Deleuze's reading of Foucault, power relations are not localized at any given moment. They constitute a strategy, an exercise of the non-stratified, and these anonymous strategies are almost mute and blind, since they evade all stable forms of the visible and the articulable. 73. The anonymity of power is a significant cornerstone of Foucault's conceptualization of discursive formations. We are not looking for a major figure to impose his, her definition of white from above, instead. We are seeking the ways it is constituted in everyday discourse and reinscribes its position on the social landscape. In What is an Author? Foucault rejects the construction of the autonomous individual as a source of power. In this study, we did not look for significant readers on whom to pin our analysis of white. Instead, we take the lens of everyday life in order to survey this territory. Maurice Blanchot underscores the significance of everyday life. Whatever its other aspects, the everyday has this essential trait, it allows no one to hold. It escapes. It belongs to insignificance, and the insignificant is without truth, without reality, without secret but perhaps also the site of all possible signification. The everyday escapes. 14. The everydayness of whiteness makes it a difficult territory to map. It is not constituted in ways that traditional methodologies can explore as Lefebvre observes. The everyday, established and consolidated, remains a sole-surviving common-sense referent and point of reference. Intellectuals, on the other hand, seek their systems of reference elsewhere. 9. In order to survey critically the territory of whiteness, we turn toward Deleuze and Guattari's nomad science, in contrast to state science to explore the everydayness of whiteness. A nomad science, in our reading, is not driven by methodology, but by perspective. Deleuze and Guattari explain that nomad science follows the connections between singularities of matter and traits of expression, and lodges on the level of these connections, whether they be natural or forced. This is another organization of work and of the social field through work. 369. We are not driven by a desire to reproduce the invisibility and universality of the center, instead. We take everyday discourse as a starting point in the process of marking the territory of whiteness and the power relations it generates. While power relations are non-stratified and not fixed, the discursive formation does have an element of the strata, but is not contained by it. In this case, the territory is defined by what constitutes and does not constitute white. Deleuze and Guattari's assemblage is useful in extending Foucault's discursive formation in this downloaded 297 Quarterly Journal of Speech Nakayama and Krizek situation as the assemblage no longer presents an expression distinct from content only unformed matters, distratified forces, and functions 505. The discourses that constitute white are material, whereas their social functions remain hidden from analysis. In his work on discursive formations, Foucault argues that these are not logically organized frameworks that function in non-contradictory ways. The construction of white as a category is replete with contradictions in the ways it expresses itself. The recognition of contradictions within discursive formations is underscored by Foucault. A discursive formation is not, therefore, an ideal, continuous, smooth text that runs beneath the multiplicity of contradictions, and resolves them in the community of coherent thought. Nor is it a surface in which, in a thousand different aspects, a contradiction is reflected that is always in retreat but everywhere are dominant. It is rather a space of multiple dissensions, a set of different oppositions whose levels and roles must be described. Archaeological analysis, then, erects the primacy of a contradiction that has its model in the simultaneous affirmation and negation of a single preposition. Archaeology of Knowledge 155 the central contradiction at work within the white discursive formation is its functional invisibility, yet importance, if whiteness is everything and nothing. If whiteness as a racial category does not exist except in conflict with others, how can we understand racial politics in a social structure that centers whites? Yet has no center, Nakayama and Peñalosa 54. In order to approach this contradiction, we need to expose whiteness as a cultural construction as well as the strategies that embed its centrality. We must deconstruct it as the locus from which other differences are calculated and organized.
The purpose of such an inquiry is certainly not to recenter whiteness, but to expose its rhetoric. It is only upon critically examining this strategic rhetoric that we can begin to understand the influences it has on our everyday lives and, by extension, our research. Traditional approaches to rhetorical study have tended to privilege public speeches as focal points of analysis. In the late 20th century, however, white public figures tend to avoid addressing the topic of whiteness with rare exception. To feature speeches in our analysis would lead to the examination of the distorting rhetoric of individuals such as David Duke or Evan Metcham, two of the few whites to address publicly the issue of whiteness. Instead, we found it necessary to address more popular or everyday rhetoric. The discourses we examine are drawn from popular culture literature, survey data, and ethnographic interviewing. Our initial impulse was to focus on popular culture and everyday interactions through the method of participant observation. We turn to survey data and ethnographic interviewing because discussions of whiteness are not often accessible through non-confrontational aspects of participant observation. We reached this conclusion based in part on a number of ethnographic encounters similar to the following. In response to the question posed by a white ethnographer, what does it mean to be white? A white individual stated, I don't know exactly know what it means to be white. But we all know, don't we? I mean I never talk about it but I know that we understand each other at some level. Like when a black guy gets on an elevator or when you have a choice to sit or stand next to a white person or a black person. You pick the white person and you download it by... 298 Quarterly Journal of Speech August 1995 Look at each other, the whites, and just know that we've got it better. You don't say anything but you know. It's in the look. We believe that this kind of communication about whiteness by whites makes it difficult to study, but vital that we do so. This phenomenon may be what one scholar has identified and named as white bonding. Sleater explains what this interaction means. I began to pay attention to what I will call white racial bonding processes white people engage in every day. Dot, dot, dot. These communication patterns take forms such as inserts into conversations, race-related, asides, in conversations, strategic eye contact, and jokes. Often they are so short and subtle that they may seem relatively harmless. I used to regard such utterances as annoying expressions of prejudice or ignorance, but that seems to underestimate their power to demarcate racial lines and communicate solidarity. 8. These discourses on whiteness are relatively hidden in everyday interaction, but when whites are confronted, when they are asked directly about whiteness, a multiplicity of discourses become visible. It is this multiplicity that drives the dynamic nature of its power relations or forces, always re-securing the hegemonic position of whiteness. In order to map a strategic rhetoric of whiteness, we have assembled a multiplicity of discourses into a discursive formation. These strategies mark out and constitute the space of whiteness. By marking this territory, we are making the critical move of not allowing white subjectivity to assume the position of the universal subject, with its unmarked territory. Our discussion of these discourses, however, is not to be read hierarchically, to do so would be to build a stray rather than an assemblage. WHITENESS as a strategic rhetoric we have uncovered six strategies of the discourse of whiteness. One discursive strategy uncovered in our marking of this territory ties white closely to power in a rather crude, naked manner. Responding to an open-ended survey question, one student simply defined white as majority, while another wrote status. The slippage between these two social positions is rather slight. Both emphasize a privileged social position grounded in their racial identity. Another student explained that white means that I am part of the majority of people living in America and sick, and that I have been brought up a white American. The specific histories and consciousness that construct the majority position remain hidden from analysis. In this space, the majority white position is not universal, rather it is particular to whites. And the power embedded in this particular position is hidden from analysis. As a commentator in a local newspaper observed, White males are everywhere. They control money and finance, they control the flow of information, they control corporate boards and union leadership. 
They predominate in police departments, they outnumber everyone in the officer ranks of the military. They are the majority of doctors and lawyers in the country. They dominate political offices at all levels of government. Dot. White males are simply not happy unless they have monopoly over everything they do. Contreras 13. Despite the statistical evidence demonstrating their secure position on power, the recognition of this power is often masked. As Newsweek observed, this is a weird moment to be a white man. True, one of them just became president, but one of downloaded by New York University at 2347 the 18th of October 24. 299 Quarterly Journal of Speech Nakayama and Krizek them always becomes president, David Gates 48. Yet this naturalized dominance is not entirely hidden from view, which is critical if it is to function as powerful. A second strategy surfaces in negative definitions of white as opposed to a positive definition. People engaging in this discourse see white as meaning that they lack any other racial or ethnic features, hence, they must be white by default. Thus, individuals described white as not being black, Hispanic, or the like. Presumably, the like refers to the people given more specificity by other respondents who said, I'm a white person with oh any black, Asia, color, sick in my background, or it means I am white, not black, brown, yellow or red. In his opening tale, one of the authors of this essay employed this strategy, we were just white, not black or brown. This strategy coincides with Kenneth Burke's conception of humans as being defined by the negative which suggests that in every affirmation, there is a negation. The strategy uncovered here reverses those poles and intimates that with every negation, there is an affirmation. In the case of whites, that affirmation remains an invisible entity. Carrot, the use of colors here is important in understanding the workings of the assemblage. White is seen as a non-color. So that when a respondent notes that white means not a colored person, the subtext may be the same as the respondent who notes that the person is white with no other bloodlines such as black, Hispanic, Asian, etc. As we read these answers, the unstated, silenced implication given its meaning and power from historical usage is that white means not having any other bloodlines to make it impure. Unlike other categories, one can only be white by not being anything else. This negative definition may be related to the invisibility of whiteness as a category or a position from which one speaks. A columnist for the Arizona Republic observed that to him, oddly, white seems neutral and appropriate when the only other ethnic group mentioned is black hook DL. White, as a subject position, is otherwise unmarked, which feels more appropriate and occupies a more universal discursive space. A writer for The Village Voice observes that the little qualifier non, in white non-Hispanic contains multitudes. It demonstrates how white people only appear after subtraction. The cultural markings of everyone else are spun out, separated, and identified in the statistical centrifuge, leaving only pure whites while 26. Whiteness is only marked in reverse. This is a characteristic of domination. Deleuze and Guattari note that the race tribe exists only at the level of an oppressed race, and in the name of the oppression it suffers, there is no race but inferior. Minoritarian, there is no dominant race, a race is defined not by its purity but rather by the impurity conferred upon it by a system of domination. 379. Within a discursive system of naming oppression, but never the oppressive class white can only be a negative and invisible entity. This characteristic of whiteness is unique to its discursive construction and must be understood as a part of its power and force. Its invisibility guarantees its unstratified nature. In an analysis of clothing catalogs, the Village Voice critiqued J. Crew's racial representation, we don't do race-oriented marketing, said Adrian Perkoff J. Crew's director of new market development, we try to make the product available to everyone. That's an old standby, we don't market to a particular ethnic group, we sell a lifestyle. As if whites are everyone, because it's assumed they have no race. Jones 52 or as Gary Indiana reflects in the village voice, we were only white downloaded. 300 Quarterly Journal of Speech August 1995 When somebody wasn't 28. The rhetoric of invisibility and universality, then, is reflected in popular press discourse.
This rhetoric extends white space to the universe. A third strategy emerged which naturalizes white with a scientific definition. As a scientific classification, it holds little meaning other than reference to what people perceive to be superficial racial characteristics, it just classifies people scientifically and not judgmentally. Within this discourse, white means nothing, except that is what color I am. We see here that whiteness is drained of its history and its social status, once again it becomes invisible. Jacques Derrida sees this invisibility as one that undergirds Western thinking, white mythology, metaphysics has erased within itself the fabulous scene that has produced it. The scene that nevertheless remains active and stirring, inscribed in white ink, an invisible design covered over in the Palimpsest 213. The history that constructed and centered whiteness becomes invisible and its functions hidden. Perhaps part of what is at work in this strategy is another invisible discursive power embedded in Western metaphysics, one that privileges the mind in the mind-body hierarchy of knowing. By referencing whiteness through science, the historical and experiential knowledge of whiteness is hidden beneath a scientific category. Conquer Good reminds us that in this tradition, mental abstractions and rational thought are taken as both epistemologically and morally superior to sensual experience, bodily sensations, and the passions. 180. The invocation of science serves to privilege reason, objectivity, and masculinity concepts that have long been viewed in the Western tradition as stable, and therefore more trustworthy. Poles in the dialectic relationships that exist as reason, emotion, objectivity, subjectivity, masculinity, femininity. Gergen traces the lofty status accorded reason to the writings of Descartes, Spinoza, Hobbes, and Newton and then on to the thinkers of the so-called Enlightenment in the 18th century, Locke, Hume, and Voltaire, among others, who placed an emphasis on the rationality of science 20. Conflating the discourse of whiteness with the label of science serves to mask irrationality and contradictions with a rational image possessing cultural currency. By conceptualizing white as natural, rather than cultural, this view of whiteness eludes any recognition of power relations embedded in this category. This naturalization process is a crucial function of culture, according to Roland Barthes, and an expression of a conservative ideology. This third discourse appears to function in contradiction with the first discourse in which whiteness is related to a position of power. A fourth strategy confuses whiteness with nationality, a legal status conferred by social institutions. In this depiction of whiteness, the vision of whiteness is bounded by national borders and re-centers whiteness. Such a rhetorical move toward territorialization is a characteristic of an assemblage. Whiteness means that I'm of American descent, or white means white American. One white respondent explicitly stated, a lot of times when people think of American, I bet you they probably think of white. They probably think it's redundant. Clearly, all Americans are not white, nor are all whites necessarily Americans. Yet this confusion has appeared in other cultural discourses, such as confusion between race and nationality in Britain. Paul Gilroy notes, some of the strange conflicts that have emerged in circumstances where blackness and Englishness appear as mutually downloaded by 301 Quarterly Journal of Speech Nakayama and Krizak exclusive attributes and where the conspicuous antagonism between them proceeds on cultural terrain, cultural studies and ethnic absolutism, 190. To conflate nationality and race is an expression of power since it relegates those of other racial groups to a marginal role in national life. Indeed, the history and tradition of the United States is replete with relentless efforts to retain and guard the boundaries of nationality with whiteness. After all, the first Congress convened under that Constitution voted in 1790 to require that a person be white in order to become a naturalized citizen of the U.S. Predictably enough, the hopeless imprecision of the term left the courts with impossible problems of interpretation that stretched well into the 20th century, Rodiger 181. This historical legacy has staked out the bounds of citizenship that have been contested ever since. As a discursive strategy, the conflation of whiteness and U.S. 
citizenship challenges the very notion of a nation of immigrants, yet the persistence of this discourse reflects territorial claims to vital political terrain. A fifth strategy can be recognized in the discourse of those individuals who refuse to label themselves, I don't agree with using ethnic terms. I'm an American and that's all. My ethnic heritage does not matter to me because that doesn't say who I am. In the same survey, when asked to provide an ethnic label for him, herself, this respondent noted, I prefer not to be labeled. I don't like the terms black, white, brown, etc. I don't see the point in labels that say nothing more about a person than the color of their skin. Grouping people by color has been done for too long. I think it's time we stopped. Character is the issue, should be not color. The assumption here is that ethnicity is racially defined. Another responded, American, I think all other terms separate people be build barriers between ethnic groups. I want to break down walls and no longer call attention to color, but the person as a human. But this same individual also wrote, I like my ethnic heritage. I'm part German, Irish, Swedish, English and some other countries. I love my heritage B. See it says where you came from. Thus, while ethnicity communicates heritage, it is something that is not to be named. For these people, two tensions became evident. On the one hand, those who felt that their ethnic heritage was irrelevant to their social location clearly rejected any claims of history. On the other hand, some respondents felt proud of their heritage but did not want to use their ethnicity as an anchoring point for their identity. In either case, the emphasis on the ideology of individualism over subjectivity, the social construction of identity, is quite clear. Also, we observed within this discursive strategy the re-emergence of whiteness as invisible, as a non-label. As one white respondent noted, labels have negative meanings a lot of the time. Any label, black, African American, nigger, honky, any of them, so I don't like to use labels. I'm just me, white. White in this case, is not seen as a label, but the other discursive markers are labels. The contradiction here is significant in the way it masks whiteness. In addition to an overt resistance to labels and particular groups or categories of labels, there is a second less obvious form of resistance at work which is the process of labeling itself. With only one or two exceptions, the individuals employing this aspect of the fifth strategy were male. In our reading of these instances, a reading based on our ethnographic involvements that allowed us to observe and record bodily reactions as well as verbal responses, we concluded that these white males reacted negatively when asked to provide an ethnic label for themselves. 302 Quarterly Journal of Speech August 1995 White males, by occupying a more strategic position than white females, have been accorded essentially a label-free existence. White females, although spared the double indemnity of non-white females, still have been involved in ongoing battles over identity and labels. Women struggle with multiple labels and meanings of all of the gender bias terms that frequent the vernacular of the day. In addition, women today often consider a variety of surname options following the exchange of marriage vows. Men usually do not. Our point here is that white women may be more accepting of the labeling process than white males because of their more tactical position as women. We see this distinction as an element of that which is strategic and that which is tactical. Contemporary debates over homosexual versus gay versus queer, black versus African American, Hispanic versus Latino versus Chicano, and others reflect tactical rhetorics. Here we see a struggle over who gets to label whom in the social construction of identity. Finally, a small group of the whites interviewed and surveyed saw their whiteness in relation to European ancestry. This historical foundation for their ethnic identity reflects an interest in what Gans has earlier identified as symbolic ethnicity. These individuals recognize their European heritage and give a specificity to whiteness. It means I am descended from European white people. While this discourse recognizes a part of its historical constitution, white of European descent this reflexivity does not necessarily mean that there has been a recognition of the power relations embedded in that history. In fact, we did not find this extended reflexivity in the responses, except perhaps in a rather vague, coded way, my ethnicity determines many factors in my life.
In a more recent study of Sinhalic ethnicity, Mary Waters found that many whites selected their ethnicity, much as one might try to accessorize a wardrobe. Ethnicity for them is not a substantial part of their everyday lives. Waters notes that Sinhalic ethnicity persists because it meets a need Americans have for community without individual cost and that a potential societal cost of this symbolic ethnicity is in its subtle reinforcement of racism. 164. Whether or not one discursively positions oneself as white there is little room for maneuvering out of the power relations embedded in whiteness. Whiteness, stated or unstated, in any of its various forms, leaves one invoking the historically constituted and systematically exercised power relations. This creates an enormous problem for those in the center who do not want to reinforce the hegemonic position of the center and for those elsewhere who would challenge this assemblage and its influence on their lives. As Foucault observed, discursive formations are replete with contradictions. In the assemblage of whiteness, we find that these contradictions are an important element in the construction of whiteness as it is by these contradictions that whiteness is able to maneuver through and around challenges to its space. The dynamic element of whiteness is a crucial aspect of the persuasive power of this strategic rhetoric. It garners its representational power through its ability to be many things at once, to be universal and particular, to be a source of identity and difference. The discourses of nationality, for example, run counter to those of scientific classification, yet the emergence of a racialized nation has been marked out time and again in the U.S. and elsewhere. The discourses that define whiteness through its historical relationships to Europe further problematize these discursive downloaded by 303 Quarterly Journal of Speech Nakayama and Krizek Movements. Whiteness eludes essentialism through this multiplicity and dynamism, while at the same moment containing within it the discourses of essentialism that classify it scientifically or define it negatively. Our point here is not that there are contradictions within this discursive assemblage. Rather our principal thesis is that these contradictions are central to the dynamic lines of power that resecure the strategic, not tactical, space of whiteness making it all the more necessary to map whiteness. Whiteness is complex and problematic. Yet in communication interactions we are expected to understand what it means when someone says, white, or, American, or even, all, American. It is perhaps when whites use whiteness in communicating with other whites that the lines of power are particularly occluded, yet resilient as ever. This also has significant implications for communication researchers. Conclusion ANDAN invitation in her analysis of how race influences the lives of white women. Ruth Frankenberg concludes that whiteness changes over time and space and is in no way a transhistorical essence 236. Indeed, this assumption has guided our inquiry into the terrain of whiteness. We have not sought any essentialized category in which borders and markers are fixed in any biological or natural sense. Whiteness, in our inquiry, is rhetorically constituted through discursive strategies that map the field of whiteness. Our survey is limited to the discourses of the late 20th century in the U.S. Maps of whiteness in other nations at other times may reveal maps constituted within differing lines of power. Rather than offer any definitive conclusions, we offer instead an invitation to further consideration and dialogue about whiteness. We prescribe no framework for this discussion but see the concept of reflexivity as an important direction for further inquiry. Hilary Lawson suggests that reflexivity is the central guiding term for life in the late 20th century, particularly for those interested in discourse, all of our claims in general. Dot dot. A reflexive in a manner which cannot be avoided. 9. We see this reflexivity occurring in a number of disciplines, including communication studies. What follows are three aspects of reflexivity that may be helpful in further examining the space of whiteness. First, reflexivity encourages consideration of that which has been silenced or invisible in academic discussions. Thus, the white social practice of not discussing whiteness is especially disturbing. Sleater explains, I suspect that our privileges and silences about whiteness are invisible to us whites partly because numerically we 
constitute the majority of this nation and collectively control a large portion of the nation's resources and media, which enable us to surround ourselves with our own varied experiences and to buffer ourselves from the experiences and the pain and rage of people of color. 6. Within the context of academic writing that silences whiteness, what kinds of power relations are reproduced within our own discipline? McCurrow, in one of his Principles of Critical Rhetoric, notes that absence is as important as presence in understanding and evaluating symbolic action theory and praxis. 107. In what ways and under what conditions does the silencing of whiteness, its presumed understanding, reproduce communication interactions between and among whites? Do our academic practices and publications reinforce these white communication practices by not interrogating whiteness? As we have shown above, downloaded by New 304 Quarterly Journal of Speech August 1995 Whiteness is a complex, dynamic, and power-laden assemblage that remains elusive. And, as Velosinov has noted, the ideological sign is always already multi-accentual. To assume that readers of communication scholarship already understand the multi-accentuality of whiteness is a mistake, for it presumes a white audience. White here is ideological, as one must play the white game, it does not require that one be white discursively or scientifically. Second, reflexivity encourages consideration of the presentation of research and the articulation of the researcher's position vis a vis social and academic structures. In his response to Ramey McCurrow's essay on critical rhetoric, Robert Harriman critiques McCurrow's presentation, read performance, as a modernist rather than postmodernist subject. Harriman writes that the writer of critical rhetoric appears as a thoroughly modern self, a disembodied thinker having no identifiable social location, writing in an impersonal style, and managing the disturbing powers of social life through the application of reason. 68. While both Harriman and Charland, as respondents to McCurrow, are concerned with the modernist discourse adopted by McCurrow, neither makes a critical move toward reflexivity, particularly around their relations to whiteness. At issue is not whether critical rhetoricians or those who critique critical rhetoric have social positions from which they write but rather how they might articulate those social positions. Following from the first and second points, reflexivity encourages an examination of the institutions and politics that produce knowledge, spearheaded by Conquer Good, Wander and others. The postmodernist influence in communication studies supports an ideological reflexivity in scholarly endeavors that rests upon the recognition that the actions and the narratives, including reports of social research that describe and interpret communication interactions, are politically created within constitutive socio-hierarchical power relations deeds and Mumbi 19. James West claims, in addressing ethnographic research practices, the modernist faction of communication studies remains anchored in modernist social science. Dot dot. That allows them to view their work and others as apolitical 210. Furthermore, he states that those adhering to the dialogic, reflexive perspective advanced by the postmodernists examine the political nature and discursive strategies of our institutions and institutionalized practices. West notes that, although many discourses do not focus on power as an overt central topic, all discourses are enacted within relations of power. 213. In his essay West challenges the power located in the discursive fields of institutional arrangements such as academia. He asserts that the power of academic discourse is maintained in part by journals that discipline and silence through rules of exclusion. He does not interrogate, however, the privileged status that is reproduced in the discourses of whiteness which, in the socio-hierarchical arrangement of U.S. culture, prefigures the power bases of academic institutions. West leaves the territory unmapped and unnamed. We contend that, by not naming and interrogating whiteness, authors such as West unwittingly conspire to secure its invisibility. While we applaud West for his project, we urge him and other communication scholars to move beyond a focus limited to the politics of academia that overlooks the strategic rhetoric of whiteness. As Michelle Wallace underscores, much more insidious to me than the problem of white intellectuals theorizing nativist data, is the problem of whiteness, itself as an unmarked term. 7. 
downloaded by New York University. 305 Quarterly Journal of Speech Nakayama and Krizek As a facet of this mapping process, we urge a consideration of whiteness in the context of other social relations, such as gender, sexual orientation, class, religion. This is an important next step in the development of this type of study. As Wood and Cox argue, explicating one's self-positioning, however, does not free one from responsibility for what is said and its consequences nor does it excuse the absences in one's knowledge. For instance, when a person says, I am a white middle-class woman, so that is the only perspective I know and it performs what I say about women, and then proceeds to speak about and for women as a group. She has abused her position. 286 N. And, if she speaks for whites as a group, she has similarly abused her position. This demonstrates how whiteness and class becomes invisible again in Wood and Cox's observation. We see a particularly glaring imbalance in the reflexivity accorded the terms white and women. An imbalance that has evolved through years of dialogue and inquiry about feminism and its relation to communication studies. As Lana Rakow correctly observes in the preface to her edited collection, the terms women and feminist cannot be taken for granted, indeed, as several authors discuss in their chapters. The terms are themselves the site for significant epistemological, cultural, and political disagreements among those of us engaged in work on gender and race, v. v. While these inquiries have investigated gender concerns and their complex relations to ideological issues, there has not been an equivalent interrogation of whiteness and its relation to ideological concerns. One step in that direction is to examine whiteness as the position from which scholars perform their studies. For example, Betty Kaufman states, This narrative is about white women, it excludes women of color and research from which it is drawn excluded women of color, albeit unwittingly by virtue of its very design 200. Kaufman begins to map the discursive territory of whiteness when she tells us that white women have capitalized upon the margin of privilege so maintained the attendant economic, educational, and cultural perquisites. In setting the agenda and claiming the benefits of the contemporary women's movement 200. What is required is an ongoing to discussion of the effects of whiteness on our research and on our personal and academic pursuits. The imbalance between discussions on gender and discussions on whiteness stems from a power differential between that which is tactical and that which is strategic. What is required are more sophisticated maps of the discursive field of whiteness. The construction of discursive space of whiteness has material effects on the entire social structure and our places in relation to it. Grossborg notes that, a territorializing machine attempts to map the sorts of places people can occupy and how they can occupy them. It maps how much room people have to move, and where and how they can move. 15. The power relations inherent in these spatial relations are embedded in our identities vis-a-vis -vis whites or qua whites. They influence communication research in our everyday lives. This is why it is important for us to map these spaces. Our essay is an invitation for communication scholars to begin to mark and incorporate whiteness into their analyses and claims, an invitation to become reflexive.